very happy to welcome to our center Laura Ford, who is um, also both a trained lawyer and a sociologist, a sociologist with a focus on uh, economic sociology, the sociology of law, uh, but also social theory and historical sociology. Um, she has um, conducted her PhD in sociology, supervised by Richard Sweatberg at Cornell University, and is currently working as a postdoc fellow at the Baldy Center for Law and Social Policy in Buffalo, New York. Said um, PhD thesis um, uh, deals with intellectual property, a study in the formulation and effects of legal culture, and as far as I could see, this fascinating study deals with um, the emergence of the idea of intellectual property rights and ties it together with the history of the nation state and then ties this nexus uh, into a larger historical framework which is especially Roman law tradition um, trying to show by a concept which I found fascinating called semantic legal ordering um, how uh, those uh, long durée traditions of legal cultures actually shape the current processes not only in law, but also of uh, state building and uh, social order in a general sense. This is what I try to uh, grasp at least. Um, she has taught and published extensively on the history of sociology on Max Weber, on the sociology of law and especially on intellectual property. And um, we are very curious for your talk um, on legacies of the sacred and private law, Roman civic religion, property and contract. Welcome and um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ben, for that very generous introduction. Um, I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here. It's an incredible privilege and honor, and so thank you very much to the organizers of this conference. And I want to apologize, because my ideal for giving a talk is to speak extempore, where I make eye contact with everyone in the room. But this is quite an august audience, and I want to be precise in what I say. So I am actually going to read, and I apologize for doing that, but then hopefully there will be an opportunity to discuss and talk afterwards so then we can make eye contact again. <laughs> okay. Um, in this paper, I'm asking a big question. Why do property and contract seem to be universal, at least to children of the West? The way I phrase the question probably makes it obvious that I don't actually think property and contract are universal. I think they are very particular legacies of the Roman law tradition but they seem to many people to be universal categories. I think that Durkheim helps us to understand why, that their apparent universality has something to do with religion. I disagree with the details of his explanation, and I will say more about why, but in the basic form of his answer, a form that asks us to look to the history of religion in answering a question about law, I think that Durkheim was absolutely right. Another way to ask the same question is to ask the following. Why do the legal institutions of property and contract seem to float free from the state in European legal history? This question is not only important for legal historians, but also for sociologists and political scientists. Having a good answer to this question would help us to better understand the development of the nation state and, I believe, to understand the emergence of very modern institutions like intellectual property. And again, I think that Dur Durkheim is absolutely right to point us in the direction of religious history in seeking an answer to this question. So now let me preview the remainder of my presentation today. I'm going to first say a little bit about my background and the reasons why I'm asking these questions. I'll then take you through an outline of my paper. I'll drill down and focus on one part of the paper, and then I'll wrap up. So first, a little bit of background about me and about the paper. Some of you will have seen from the program that I wrote a dissertation about intellectual property and Daniel very kindly looked into the dissertation and told you a little bit about it. This was a dissertation from my PhD in sociology. It was a historical and comparative dissertation looking at the emergence of intellectual property as a new type of legal property. The <coughs> dissertation was big and wide ranging, but one of the basic conclusions that I came to is that intellectual property emerged as part of the modern nation state around the 18th century. I also argue that intellectual property first emerged in England, so I've been particularly interested since the dissertation in how forms of the modern nation state emerged in England. I've been trying to get a handle on what exactly it is about the nation state that contributed to the emergence of intellectual property as a new type of legal property. In looking at the legal history of nation state development in England, I've been exploring the close connections between the common law tradition and the Reformation era, so 17th century um, English parliaments. 
What has been so striking to me is the role of religious language and rhetoric in the way that English jurists of the 17th century talk about English common law. I've come to the conclusion that English common law has very strongly religious roots. But in the Reformation more broadly, we see so much blending of legal and religious language and rhetoric. We pick this up even in the pre-Reformation era in writings of John Wycliffe, who talks about the law of Christ and draws very strong conclusions from this, but then also certainly in the writings of, of Luther and Calvin. And of course, sociologists have argued that the Reformation played a very important role in nation state formation. One conclusion that I've come to is that the Reformation was not only a revolutionary moment in social and political organization, but it was also a revolutionary moment in law. One common thread that we see running through the Reformation era into the 18th century, so during the period that was so crucial to, the nation, to nation state formation and to the emergence of intellectual property, is the deployment of the natural law tradition. One conclusion that I've come to about the natural law tradition is that this is really the Roman law tradition in disguise. So John Locke, for example, in his very influential natural law arguments in deploying forms of argument that are drawn from Roman law methods of acquiring property, specifically accession and occupancy. So he blends these in really interesting ways in, art in articulating this labor-based theory for how we legitimately acquire property. What's so powerful about his argument is that he makes this seem universal, but in fact he's drawing on a very specific legal tradition. So having said this, I, I should say just a little bit about my background in Roman law. Unlike most Americans, I actually have a little bit of training in Roman law because I studied law in Louisiana. And as I'm sure you all know, Louisiana's law is a hybrid between civil law and common law. So in learning about property law in Louisiana, we study Roman law. And in order to study Roman law, we have to learn a little bit about the history of Roman law. So ever since my days as a law student, I've remained fascinated by Roman law and the history of Roman law. So now with this background, I expect you can see why I find Durkheim's discussions of law and religion both interesting and relevant to the kinds of questions that I'm asking. So now let me say a little bit about my paper for this conference. First, it's important to say that I almost exclusively focus on one particular work of Durkheim's. In English, this work has been published under the title Professional Ethics and Civic Morals, but the people in this audience will know this as a translation of Durkheim's lectures on the nature or physique of morals and right. I also draw a little bit on Durkheim's lectures on moral education. In this series of lectures, Durkheim addresses the foundation of morality and legality in the economic sphere, in the political sphere, and then in the sphere of ethics in general. The, he calls it the universal sphere of humanity. So this is coming back to the themes from this morning about cosmopolitanism. Um, in these lectures, Durkheim has very interesting things to say about property and contract. In particular, he treats them as universal categories. And this is very striking because throughout the other parts of the lectures, he's been arguing essentially that the foundation for mor morality and law rests in social groups. It's in particular social groups that we learn morality, and in the absence of particular groups that, that provide discipline and training, we lack morality, which is precisely why he thought we needed a return to the guilds in the economic sphere, because we didn't have a form of social uh, organization in that sphere. So with Durkheim, it becomes particularly interesting to ask, how are the moral duties connected with property and contract universal when other moral duties are not, are in fact quite particular to particular social organizations or groups? I think there are two answers to this question, one having to do with the influence of Durkheim's teacher, Fustel de Coulanges, and the second having to do with the way Durkheim viewed the development of ethics and history. I'll come back to the second part of the answer, but for now I want to focus on the influence of Coulanges. So in the paper, I begin with a summary of Coulanges' powerful narrative about the development and collapse of the ancient city. And I was a little bit worried that everyone in this audience would just know this argument and that I would be boring you by saying a little bit about it. But in writing the paper, I can't assume that the people who are reading the paper know, know this argument. And it's a very powerful argument. So I, I think it's important to provide a, enough information about the structure of Coulanges' argument in order to understand the structure of Durkheim's argument. So for the readers of my paper who haven't read Coulanges' book, I think it's necessary to see certain things. In writing the paper, I've had an opportunity to revisit Coulanges, and I've been struck once again by the power of his argument. So I read it years ago, and, I, and it profoundly influenced me, and now coming back to it again, I, I see that it's very, very powerful. One way to summarize Coulanges would be to say that he roots the fundamental institutions of European private law, especially property, in the familial religion of the ancient Greco-Roman city. For Coulanges, the legal form of the ancient Greco-Roman city was built on earlier religious forms connected with family-based religions involving ancestor worship and beliefs about death. 
Coulange sees this family-based religion as earlier than the city and as providing forms of private law institutions, again, particularly property, that get sort of enlarged and transposed with the development of the ancient city-state. These forms of familial religion are fundamentally particularistic, and this particularism is what gives them their power. So each extended family's religion has, it, has its own gods and its own forms of worship connected with the dead ancestors who are buried within the family property. This particularistic familial religion ties the family to the land and creates an almost unbreakable bond between the family, represented by the pater familias, and the land. So for Coulange, the power of ancient property is rooted in this unbreakable bond that is formed between a particular family and a particular plot of land. The ancient city-state is formed, he thinks, as essentially a union of clans. Because of the particularism of ancient religion, this union can only be formed as a religious union, a union of worship. In order for this union to occur, the familial religion gets extended so that the city itself is seen as an extended family with a common hearth, with a common property boundary. This is important and I'll come back to it. But the final thing I want to say about Coulanges has to do with what he says about Christianity. Coulanges sees the rise of Christianity as giving a sort of death blow to the ancient city-state. And this is essentially because the forms of religious belief involved in Christianity are fundamentally incompatible with the ancient Greco-Roman familial religion. In Christianity, there is one God, and that God is universal. People either worship this one God or they don't, and this is something that people choose. There's something voluntary, something involving will. Coulange also thinks that the transcendent otherworldliness of the Christian God is important. The ancient city-state can only be maintained, Coulange thinks, as a particular legal community, and the rise of Rome as an expanding empire together with the rise of Christianity undermine the particularism of this legal community. So to summarize, Coulange focuses our attention, and Durkheim's attention, I think, on three things. The importance of Greco-Roman civic religion, i.e. the religion of the Roman city-state, the universalizing force of Christianity, and the importance of legal bonds in forming social communities and legal institutions. So this brings us to Durkheim. Why does Durkheim say that property and contract are universal? Both are tied to a process of moral development that involves the increasing moral significance of the individual human being. For Durkheim, the moral obligation not to steal the property of another person and to honor a consensual contract is tied to the moral dignity of the individual human being. Durkheim conceptualizes both property and contracts as moral and legal bonds. Property involves an exclusive bond between a person and thing, and contract involves a social bond between persons. Our obligation to honor both of these bonds is rooted in the honor that we give to another human being as a human being. And Durkheim thinks this is a universal moral obligation. But he's interested in explaining how this universal moral obligation emerged, and he thinks religion played a very important role. I think that for Durkheim, religion plays a kind of moral educative role. It teaches us to treat as sacred the exclusive bond between a person and a thing i.e. property, and the consensually given consent to undertake something, i.e. Con e. contract. It teaches us to treat these as sacred. So for Durkheim, religious history, and especially the history of Christianity, lead to a fundamental break between antiquity and modernity. Christianity performs a morally educative role in teaching humanity to give fundamental respect to individual human persons. But for Durkheim, religion itself is merely a mythological way of representing the moral force of society. So with secularization, the religious language and mythology is itself stripped away. He thought that we needed to be very thoughtful about the way that these were stripped away, but these, are, these get stripped away, and we are left simply with universal moral obligations. For Durkheim, religion is universal because society and moral development are universal. This way of universalizing religious and moral development is problematic in Durkheim, I think, and I will come back to this. But back to the paper. In the third section of the paper, I focus on Durkheim's explanation for the existence of property. For Durkheim, property is an exclusive bond between a person and a thing, and he thinks only the social force of religion can explain how such a bond is possible. He rejects a number of other explanations for the existence of property because he thinks they cannot adequately account for the power and character of this bond. It's important to say here that for Durkheim, legal and moral bonds are a uniting social force. They cause us to become one with a person or a thing. With property, a union is created between a person and a thing such that the owner can dispose of the thing and another cannot. So what are the social conditions that can explain the historical emergence of this exclusive union between a person and a thing? 
Durkheim thinks that, the, that only the endowment of a sacred character to the thing could accomplish this. So Durkheim ties the respect for property to the idea that things can be sacred. That is, that they can be untouchable for all but a certain select few who are themselves sacred in some way that makes it possible for them to touch a sacred thing. He works through this at the level of ideas, but then he wants to see if he can find a historical moment at which this idea was given reality. He finds this in the rituals of boundary drawing in the ancient city-state, and he draws very heavily on Coulange in his description of these rituals. As far as I can tell, what Durkheim and Coulange both describe are religi religious rituals and festivals connected to the boundaries of the Roman city-state, what was called the Pomerium. The Pomerium was the boundary around Rome, and there were mythologies about the drawing of these boundaries by Romulus that seemed to have been celebrated annually in a festival called the Perilia. These religious ideas and rituals were connected to beliefs about the termini, gods of boundaries, and to religious rituals connected with the establishment of colonies where they would go through these rituals in, in establishing colonial settlements. It's important to emphasize that the ancient sources seem to be quite limited in terms of what we can know about the religious beliefs connected with these rituals, let alone the rituals themselves. But Durkheim and Coulange both generalize in quite breathtaking ways about them, interestingly in ways that are quite different from each other. For Coulange, these rituals create a kind of protected enclosure for the family and its religion. For Durkheim, on the other hand, these rituals concentrate the, tower, the terrifying and, and, and deathly power of the sacred in boundaries so that they keep everyone out except the sacred person who performed the ritual. I think the explanation for this difference between Coulange and Durkheim, by the way, has something to do with very different conceptions of the sacred that they are working with. In Durkheim, the sacred is conflated, I think, with ideas of taboo and ideas of holiness, whereas for Coulange, it's, and, and by holiness, I mean the ho holiness tradition in ancient Israelite religion. Um, but, but for Coulange, it seems to be something quite different, something much warmer and enclosing, you know, the, you're, you're being enclosed with your dead ancestors. There's something warm and welcoming about it. Um, for both Durkheim and Coulange, these rituals explain the existence of property. For Durkheim, this explanation is universal because religion is a universal morally educative force. For Coulange, this explanation is more historically particular, but there are implications for private law even into his own time, I think. So in the final section of my paper, I ask whether we can draw a lesson from Durkheim and Coulange about why property and contract seem universal. I think that Durkheim and Coulange point the way forward in two ways. In focusing our attention on the historical role of Christianity, and in drawing our attention to boundary drawing rituals in the Greco-Roman city. So the final section of my paper is called The City of God, and here I'm drawing on the title for one of Augustine's most famous works. And I've been reading Augustine alongside Durkheim, and it's fascinating how much the, that is Augustinian in, in Durkheim. So this idea of love as a bonding force is really, really powerful in Augustine, and, I, and you know, it just jumps out at me when I'm, when I'm reading Durkheim. Um, this is a part of the paper that I'm still working through and I would enjoy discussing some of these ideas with you. Um, but here's, here's the sort of essence. So for, for Augustine, the city of God is the church. And this is a union of souls, an intergenerational union of souls. He has a whole social ontology of this. It's really fascinating. Um, but it's sojourning here on earth and it will eventually become heavenly um, in, in, in the future. So this is a history of the church. But it's called the city of God. And, and Augustine is using all of this language and mythology around the Greco-Roman city in describing this uh, civitas. You know, and he, so, and he, he draws in so much of the, of the Greco-Roman tradition in, in elaborate. I mean, this is a, an elaborate work. And I should say that in the paper, I'm not just looking at Augustine. I'm sort of looking at him as the culminating point of, of, a, of a, a tradition of, de of development of, of theological reflection about the church in North Africa specifically, where they struggled especially with these conflicts over, over Donatism and who was authorized to baptize. And you know, So there's a whole discussion around what the church is and what the boundaries of the church is that was particularly important in North African Christianity. And I think that this is a very important dimension of, of Augustine. So I don't have much time to say more about this in, in, in my proposed my remarks, in my formal remarks, but the bottom line is that I think that property and contract came to be seen as universal because they were universalized in the cultural traditions of the Christian church. And I don't j mean just the Christian church, 
because later the universities take over some of this role and, and you know, we have other, what Durkheim would call secondary organizations that maintain these cultural traditions. But the church is a crucial character in the period of late antiquity and, and the early medieval period. And um, I'm not the first to say this, but I think what focusing on the church helps us to see is how these traditions came to be married to the idea of the sacred, right? So they're being carried by a community that, that is itself seen as being sacred. So with um, with the Reformation and secularization, these traditions were pulled away from the church and from Christianity such that now they seem like universal moral legal categories, again, to the children of the West. However, I think that they are in fact very particular and somewhat problematic legal legacies from the productive fusion of Greco-Roman civic religion and Jewish and Christian religion. I think that Durkheim's lectures on morality remain extremely valuable because they point to an answer about how these traditions came to be seen as universal and although I disagree with the specifics of his explanation, I think that Durkheim is right to say that the explanation for their apparent universality is to be found in religious history. Thank you very much.